Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I must say that uh, I was really touched by the irony of having uh, an Italian example on how to coordinate in a country where actually chaos is the norm. So I thought it was actually very inspiring for, for once. So good morning. Uh, today, I wanted to call this speech beyond the obvious, because as uh, the introduction just said, when we talk about IoT, it often seems very technology driven, difficult to understand somewhere very far in the future. And, and honestly, it's very difficult to grab that the reality is very different. So let me walk you through that. But let me start first from the obvious. The obvious is this. The obvious is what many people are talking about. I, IoT is a new ecosystem that is being formed that is worth 5.3 billion and it is includes basically services, connectivity, and hardware. Not only it's a, huge, it's a huge business in terms of volume, but also in terms of value, because what the expectations don't say is that by putting together hardware, services, and connectivity, the value of the industry will grow even further. Today, it's at around 100 billion, so the, the growth for the next uh, seven years is expected to almost triple the size of the industry. Second thing which you would expect from me from what I'm doing is that I have a title to talk about it. Uh, basically, this, this is actually what, not we, what we say, but what Gardner says. We actually have invested hugely for the last 10 years betting on the idea that IoT was going to be a platform business. And we have built a connectivity platform that is actually enabling globally, enabling businesses to actually run IoT. But if you really want to keep it simple and you want to start going beyond the obvious, you really wonder what's so special about now? And honestly, why is it that they call it the singularity moment? And to keep it really simple, the way, the way I see it is that when you're talking data, and data is the new gold, you actually need three things on data. You need to capture them, store them, and use them. And actually, the interesting thing about the last 18 months, 24 months, is actually that a solution for these three issues has come together, and at the same time, and in a very cheap form. You can now capture through IoT, which is what we do. You can actually store through cloud at very decent price. And now, through AI, you can actually analyze and use this information. So what's so special about now is the three things have come together. And this is what is opening the possibility to drive change. Now, very often when we talk about IoT, it sounds like we are talking about technology and future. Actually, the point that I want to demonstrate today is that we are not talking about technology, but we are talking about people. And we are not talking about future, but we are talking about now. And the way I want to do it is not through slides or theories, but through three, three stories that I think really tell something about the way people can use technology. So let me start from the first story. I don't know how many of you have heard about Sanku. Sanku comes from an idea of a very small group of people who really had in common one crazy thought. And the thought was, can we eradicate malnutrition to 100 million people? You know, you need to be, you need to be brave and crazy to think about something like that. Huh? In a continent like Africa, where malnutrition is a huge issue, this small group of people thought, how can we go about eradicating it for 100 million? And they spent quite a bit of time trying to go to what we would call the root cause of the issue. And so let me bring you to Tanzania. This is the way, basically, people eat in Tanzania. This is a meal. Every village has a meal. People travel also from very long distances to the village. They come with their bags. There's only one meal, and the meal basically gives the wet 
to the people who put it in the bag, go back to the villages, and then put it together with water and everything else, and they eat out of it. Now, what is the issue? The issue is that since the meal cannot be controlled, the quality of the wet cannot be controlled. Obviously, there is a, a very high fragmentation and dispersion over Tanzania of those meals. So what happens is that people, over time, got used to go and actually collect wet, which didn't have any nutrition component, was lacking of vitamin and protein. Now, this small group of people came up with the idea of Sanku, and Sanku is basically built with the intention of doing a very noble cause, uh, eradicating malnutrition, but with the idea that it has to be a sustainable business. And the idea was actually very simple. If we could connect those meals, uh, knowing what is the amount of wet that is being delivered on a daily basis, then we could also decide how often we need to bring vitamins and proteins to the meal in order to actually mix it in the right way with the wet. Very simple. The idea, as you can see there, it's a, very, it's a very basic machine. You need to be quite brave with the idea that you can actually connect it. But this is exactly what they did. They came up with the idea of connecting, I don't know if you can see the bottom part of the mill. The bottom part of the mill now actually has a module that uh, can control the amount of wet being produced by the meal and delivered, and actually has a formula, a very simple formula, to decide how much protein and vitamin needs to be mixed. This is connected to remote, so actually centrally, the Sanku company can decide where, how many trucks they need to send where, because they know how much it is being consumed. They have now a very scalable formula, and after two years after the implementation of this, they can actually now see the solution to this issue. I think it's incredibly inspiring that in Tanzania, on a mill, on a very basic machine, they actually thought of one use of technology, which actually many other people are not even using in much more developed side of the world. Let me go to another example. And this story, again, going on people, it's the story of Karen. I met Karen uh, two years ago. She's Norwegian. She's 30-something. And she basically had a story in her family which was very touching, because she had a nephew who actually ended up spending uh, a long period of time, six months plus, in an hospital for therapies and so on. And the nephew was very young, and uh, as she went through this period, uh, she learned something from his nephew and from, her, from his mom. The problem with long-term sickness, uh, and I, I, I know that some of you can probably connect to that, the problem with long-term sickness is not much the therapy, but it's the fact that people get isolated through the therapy. They basically get to spend all of a sudden all their time in an hospital secluded from their families, their friends, in the case of kids, even worse, secluded from schools. This is a big issue. When you talk to hospitals, especially hospitals that treat kids, they call this the one issue, because actually kids end up treating, in most cases, their problems, but when they finish and they exit the hospital, they have another problem, which is to go back into society or into school after having lost six to 12 months. Now, the idea of Karen was, again, incredibly simple. She said, how can we make sure that somebody sitting on an hospital bed can still take part in the most important social activities that they do? And she came up with a very basic idea. The idea was basically to connect a tablet with an object, which is, by the way, in our booth outside, if you want to see it. It's this small robot. She didn't give a name to the robot, because she thought that the name of the robot should be decided by every single patient, because it's a replica of himself. It's a very simple piece of hardware. If you want a technology jargon, it would be a telepresence gadget. It's connected with 4G connections inside, so again, very basic technology. And what it does is that it enables the patient, in this 
the kid that you just saw before, to basically, for instance, take part to his school classes. But not only taking part to school classes, but actually to interact, because not only he can see what's being taught at school, but he can actually talk and ask questions through his tablet. He can basically do play dates with his friends. And all of a sudden, he can spend time socially even while he's treating his, uh, his, uh, his problems. Again, it's another very simple piece of technology that solves a real big issue for, for people. The third example, to just again reiterate that it's not about theories or technologies, but it's about people and change. Actually, I want to show it to you on this stage. And I would ask George to come on stage with me. George was extremely unlucky. And a few years back, he had a very bad accident. And he actually lost his downside of his body. Hi, George. Welcome on stage. Hi, Stefanos. Welcome. Now, George is here today with us because what I want to show you is what can happen if we apply the available technologies to real life problems. So George had this accident and he started to do treatment and therapies. I'm going to ask a translation because I'm going to ask him some, some questions. And then I want to show you something. So George is using, during his treatment, uh, an exoskeleton. An exoskeleton is basically a skeleton, which you see here, that is connected. Connected means that it has a number of sensors that are then connected to remote. And in his therapy, he's using this skeleton. And the question that I would like to ask him is, how has it changed your therapy, the ability to use the skeleton? Γιώργο, πώς η δυνατότητα να χρησιμοποιήσει αυτό το μηχάνημα έχει αλλάξει τη, τη ζωή σου σε σχέση yeah. και με το μαξίδιο. Mm. Έχει, έχει θεραπευτικό σκοπό το εξωσχέλετον. Αρχικά βοηθάει στο κυκλοφορικό μου σύστημα πάρα πολύ. Δηλαδή με την ακινησία των ποδιών μπορεί να υπάρξει κάποια θρόμβωση, την αποφεύγουμε έτσι. Επίσης βοηθάει στα οστά, μην υπάρχουν ζημιές και στο μυϊκό σύστημα γιατί έχουμε ατροφή σημείες, ας το πούμε. Πέρα από αυτά, όμως, βοηθάει και ψυχολογικά για να φτάσω στο πέρα στη θεραπεία. Δηλαδή, είναι βασικό κομμάτι της θεραπείας μου. So, the main purpose of this exoskeleton is therapeutic. Uh, fundamentally, in terms of improving blood circulation, uh, muscular exercise and function, and also to prevent uh, bone degeneration. But uh, a, a, at a more fundamentally and ultimate level, to uh, improve the psychological uh, well-being and motivation of George to carry on and complete his therapy. Do you mind uh, showing us how it works? Of course. <laughs> so while George is being helped, uh, I will move a little bit backward. He's going to be helped uh, by his physiotherapist uh, to actually wear the skeleton. Let me just explain this. No, no, no. At the moment, Exobionics is a company, is a customer of ours, is an American company. They do exoskeletons, which are basically used for therapeutic treatment. They are not yet used for everyday use. But clearly, the ambition of this company is to then be able, as we go along, to solve this and use this for everyday use. So the way it works is that it's a basically it's a, it's a skeleton which basically connects a number of joints through sensors to a module which from remote can be used to coordinate and communicate information that are needed for the patient. It's a, it's a process that needs technician and physiotherapist obviously to be, to be set up. And it's something that, at the moment, uh, is available only, as I said, in therapeutic treatments. Now, I wanted uh, to show you this uh, because I think it can be 
a sign of what technology means when it's applied to a real life very big problem. They are activating the system now. Take your time, no pressure. Thank you, George. It's, uh, it's really impressive. It's really impressive to see this happening. Uh, I, must, I must say it's something that I find uh, incredibly touching. And especially, thank you very much, because you have been uh, so kind to come to us and uh, to show us what this means for your life. Thank you very much for, for this. Thank you also to the physiotherapy team. Thank you. Uh, look, let me, let me conclude this. Obviously, when, when we started to, do, we, to think that we were going to do this, uh, you're always a bit uh, uh, torn, right? Because you're talking about a story that, as you can imagine, is a, is a very difficult story to, to say. And obviously, there's no intention here to you know, take advantage of this story. But actually, the reason why I wanted to show it to you is really because it goes to the essence uh, of the issue today. The issue today is not about technology anymore. And if you're sitting there thinking all what we are hearing in this presentation, it's about the future and it's about what's coming, actually, I think you're not getting it. The technology is available now. The issue today, and, and this is why I wanted to show you this, it's about how much as people do we believe in this room, yourself, myself, how much do we believe to the fact that we can change the way we do things? You know, the way this therapy would have been treated two or three years ago was completely different. Here, somebody has thought of a completely new, different way of treating this. So to me, the real message that I want to leave you with is this is not about the future. This is about now. And actually, when you want to think about the Internet of Things, think that it's not about things, but it's about people, people like you, like me, like all of us. And it's about the fact that we can drive change through technology. Thank you very much.